Hello, I am Kate Warren, Executive Vice President at DevX and honored to be moderating this important discussion on preparing for the next pandemic, lessons on strengthening health systems and supply chains. Um, thank you all for joining us today. So the COVID-19 pandemic has reinforced how critical health systems are supported by strong supply chains that provide healthcare workers and communities with access to the medicines, healthcare commodities and equipment they need to fight health emergencies and ensure continuity of ongoing healthcare. We now face the monumental task of not only rebuilding our health systems, but also ensuring they're better prepared and equipped to withstand future crises. Um, as we look ahead to the UN General Assembly next week, we have assembled uh, today a variety of experts from agencies leading on these issues to highlight lessons learned from the COVID-19 pandemic and how they are informing their future work and collaborations. Um, they will share experiences from their agency's COVID-19 responses in order to highlight ways the international development community can seize this window of opportunity to strengthen supply chains and future-proof health systems for people everywhere. I would like to first thank our partners for today's event, the UN World Food Program, the International Atomic Energy Agency, the United Nations Population Fund, and Takeda Pharmaceutical Company Limited. Um, thank you so much for helping to bring this conversation together today. Um, just a quick note, we do have live captioning available via Zoom for anyone who would like to utilize this feature. Uh, you can access it from the live transcript button that you see at the bottom of the Zoom window. So to kick off today's event, I'd like to invite Rakia Yakub, who's the regional uh, Deputy Regional Director for East Africa at WFP and former Country Director for WFP Ghana. Rukia, um, thank you for joining us today and I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Kate. And thank you, distinguished guests and delegates for joining this event and this important conversation on strengthening health systems and supply chains. I would like to start by extending special thanks to DEVEX, Takeda Pharmaceuticals, UNFPA, the IAEA for co-hosting this event with the World Food Programme. Also a warm greeting to the distinguished speakers from Africa CDC, the Association of Africa Central Medical Stores, WHO, and the Center for Global Development, who will be sharing their valuable insights with us today. As the world's largest humanitarian organization, the World Food Program mandate is to end hunger by saving and changing lives. We do so by delivering food assistance in emergencies and working with partners and communities to improve nutrition and build resilience. WFP's supply chain plays a pivotal role in the fight against hunger. On any given day, WFP has 5,600 trucks, 30 ships, and nearly 100 planes on the move delivering food and other assistance to those in most need. Every year, more than 15 billion Russians are distributed to the most vulnerable communities in more than 80 countries. These numbers lie at the roots of WFP's unparalleled reputation as an emergency or responder, one that gets the job done quickly at scale and the most difficult environments. Over the last few years, and in line with SDG 17 on partnership, WFP has also significantly extended its role in support of partners such as the World Health Organization and UNICEF to respond to health emergencies and help strengthen supply chain capacities. We are here today for the event convened by WFP, the IAEA and UNFPA with the support of Takeda Pharmaceuticals and the participation of key speakers from organizations in the health space to share experiences from COVID-19 response and discuss opportunities to future-proof health systems and supply chains. COVID-19 has severely impacted global 
regional and local health systems. And fragile systems have paid the highest price. Considering the growing likelihood of future health emergencies, there is now a call to action for the global community to come together and help strengthen these health systems in preparation for the next potential pandemic. So how do we do this? First, we must build reliable and resilient supply chains to ensure that health equipment, products, and medicines can be delivered efficiently and reliably in the event of a health crisis, even in the most remote areas. This will enable us to equip qualified health workers with the right tools so they are able to serve all patients across communities. Second, we need to provide adequate technology, equipment, and training to support diagnostic in the event of a pandemic. And this is why the need for creative, innovative partnership and collaboration has never been greater. As a country director for WFE in Ghana in, from 2017 and 2021, I have seen firsthand the long lasting effects of Ebola in the region, followed by the more recent impacts of COVID-19 pandemic. I witnessed the cumulative effect this pandemic has still on people's lives and livelihoods, their ability to access health services and their food security. The disruption of supply chains was among the key causes of, the, of this effect. Global, regional, and local supply chain systems were not sufficiently prepared to respond to such an unprecedented crisis. There are many learnings from WFP's response to COVID-19 pandemic, but I would like to highlight three of them as I think they are the most crucial. One is the strategic partnership, especially those pre-established partnerships with public and private actors were key to fast and effective response. For example, when WFE leveraged its existing partnership with several ministries of the Ghanaian government, these relationships helped secure almost immediate permission to utilize the United Nations Humanitarian Response Depot in Accra as a UN humanitarian hub for the COVID response. A UN field hospital was also established during a period of airport and border closures. The government of Ghana allocated a construction site for the field hospital and permitted WFE to immediately operate cargo and passenger aviation services. It also allowed five cargo flights into the country transporting various components of the hospital, as well as the construction team. The team supported by local contractors constructed the field hospital in a record time of four weeks, handing it over to the World Health Organization to operate. The second one is harmonized uniform approach to supply chain operations amongst the humanitarian community allowed for a rapid scale up and prevented fragmentation. The third one was resilient public health supply chains were those that continue to use existing and, and embedded supply chain processes to deliver essential health services, even during the pandemic. Therefore, working with governments to strengthen national health systems through improved health supply chains and data are key to effective response to any future health crisis pandemic. Despite these important lessons, it re remains true that pandemic preparedness is only at the forefront of people's mind when a crisis happens. So how do we ensure that preparedness stays relevant and remains priority? How do we remain alert and vigilant? How do we stay geared up? I'm very happy to be here today. As I know, we will glean from the valuable insights of our distinguished speakers 
and thought leaders from various organizations, especially those in the health space. Thank you. And I look forward to hearing from the discussions that are to follow. I'm happy to kick off today's discussion with two experts working on health systems and the issue of supply chains on the African continent. They're both working tirelessly on these issues every day. So I thank them for taking the time to share with us what they're hearing, what they're seeing and want to see and some of the lessons learned so far. So please welcome to the virtual stage, Dr. Anne Marais Kahabor, who is the Director General of Comeg, which is the central purchasing of essential drug and medical consumables in Burkina Faso. She is also the permanent secretary of ACAME, African Association of Central Medical Stores for Essential Drugs. We are also waiting for Dr. Ahmed Agwal Auma, who's the deputy director of the Africa Centers for Disease Control and Prevention uh, to join us here shortly. But in the meantime, I, I would like to start with you, Anne. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Garrett, for inviting me. Well, the organization you lead, uh, Kameg, is in charge of the supply of pharmaceutical products to all health structures in Burkina Faso, um, so not a small feat. What consequences yeah. have these supply chains issues and disruptions had on access um, to and the quality of healthcare in Burkina Faso over these past, what some you know, 18 months that we've been living through this pandemic? Yeah, in fact, the procuring and warehousing agency that we call CAMEG in Burkina Faso is a sort of, you know, national central medical stores um, in our country. So our mission is to make high quality essential medicine geographically available all over the territory and uh, financially accessible also. So first and foremost at CAMEG, we have been involved, you know, in an ongoing process of improving the quality and the management um, assurance of pharmaceuticals in line with um, the WHO um, MQAS guidelines, but also the international standard organization, so ISO 9001 certification. We have been through all these frameworks just to be sure that we are ensure and reassuring populations, governments, uh, buyers, but also donors, that our products are purchased, warehoused, and distributed in optimal conditions. So, however, our supply chain has been severely impacted by COVID-19, and the main consequences include commodity price increasing and dealing with stockouts of key commodities. And this is mainly due to, you know, increased cost of raw materials, increased price of commodities and freight costs, uh, the shortage of freight forwarders, transportation means, and also significant delays of delivery. But we have to tell that um, Burkina Faso is a landlocked country, so that's why the access is quite more difficult, but we try to do our best to maintain our goal and um, still the selling price of our products to the population has not changed yet, despite purchase prices and transport costs of the global level have increased and continue to rise. So we have resilient plans that we implemented since the beginning of the pandemic, but it's been impacted by all those external factors that I have mentioned um, above. And if those factors are not resolved at the global level, they will cause higher short or long-term shortage. And worse, we will have to increase the price of medicine to population, which will greatly strain the pocketbook of our population. As you know, um, in Burkina Faso and generally in sub-Saharan Africa, over 90% of population do not have health insurance and all the procurement of essential medicines are done out of pocket. So we really, we really need to urgently work together to facilitate and guarantee equitable and universal access to the right product at the right time to the right customer, but more importantly, at the right price for the most vulnerable population that we have. 
Right, and you, you know, you also serve as the permanent secretary of ACAME, um, and so working across 22 different sub-Saharan African countries. Are these some of the same challenges you're experiencing? And what are some of the solutions and maybe key lessons you've seen from the work you're doing um, on addressing pricing or any other barriers to access? Uh, yes, currently, in fact, I wear two hats um, as general manager of CAMEG, but also um, I've been the permanent secretary of ACAM for more than three years now. And, you know, ACAM is a sort of association of 22 um, central medical stores in Africa, um, coming from the north of Africa with, uh, you know, like Algeria, Tunisia, uh, the central part of Africa with Cameroon, Gabon. We have also the east part uh, represented with, by Djibouti, the west part with Mali, Senegal, and we have also Indian Ocean with Comoros and Madagascar. We certainly have had lesson learned and we identify also some solutions, but I want to focus on the major one for us, which is having a pandemic preparedness plan that ensure the continuity of the supply of essential medicine. This should be an ongoing requirement for us, as we all know that COVID-19 will not be the last pandemic that we are facing. Um, as lesson learned, I will mention quickly three main lessons for us. The first for us is that it is imperative that we support um, local pharmaceutical production for medicine, but also for APIs. This will help balance out a shortage or stockouts when there are export restrictions at global level or when the borders are closed. The second one for us will be to have a sort of sufficient quality buffer stock to prevent quick stockout. Uh, this means also having a functioning logistic management information systems LMIS that will include last mile's data. And the third one, uh, not the last but not the least, uh, we really must now move into pool procurement within our 22 countries. This is just imperative. I believe it will be a win-win solution for everyone as we would procure even greater quantities at cost-effective rates and we will turn uh, guarantee the availability and affordability of the drugs for the most vulnerable population. Um, as African people, we really need to accelerate the implementation of the African Continental Free Trade Area set up by the African Union. That will help reorganize you know, the regional markets and economies that will stimulate production and particularly in the pharmaceutical sector. So this is really key for us, as we have seen in this pandemic that all the borders has been closed and it was really, really tough to have those sort of drugs. However, however, it is important to note that all these things can be possible only if the central medical store or the central procuring and warehousing agencies such as CAMEG in Burkina Faso or NPSP in Ivory Coast, etc. Only if those agencies are given a seat at the table of the decision-making process and if they are continuously involved in the global supply chain response. Otherwise, it cannot be possible. So this is key for us. Great, thank you. Um, and I think we do have Ahmed Agwal Aluma, the Deputy Director of the African CDC, uh, joining us. Ahmed, are you able to join the conversation? Hello, welcome, Dr. Ahmed Aluma. Thanks, thanks, Kate, and my, my apologies. We've got our times mixed up. I've traveled from uh, Ethiopia to, uh, to, to Egypt, so um, the whole hour got lost somewhere in between. So my apologies. No problem. No, thank you. And I know we, we have quite a bit going on. So we're, we're thankful that you are joining us today. Yeah. Uh, just talking with uh, Dr. Anne-Marie um, around uh, some of her work with Kamed and Akame. And so wanted to maybe see your perspective. You know, obviously we're talking about um, the stress that COVID-19 has had on 
supply chains and health systems. You're at the African CDC, so right in the middle of the action of the COVID response. So can you share with us um, in what ways you've seen the pandemic really stress the link between strong supply chains, resilient health systems, and pandemic preparedness on the African continent? Um, no, thank you. Thank you for having me. And uh, um, as Africa CDC, we are very pleased um, uh, to join the panel today uh, to speak about um, <clears throat> the, the stresses of uh, uh, COVID-19. Um, so um, first, I think, um, let me uh, start by saying that um, during this um, uh, pandemic time, uh, three, three significant things have happened on the continent. One is, let me start with the positive, then I'll go to the negative and cover the question. One is that um, the health systems did not get overwhelmed uh, quickly, as everyone had uh, predicted. Um, and um, we were very happy that the predictions uh, came wrong. Um, and the, the reason for the um, uh, delay, if you want, in um, uh, big numbers being seen on the continent was the effective um, coordinated uh, approach to COVID-19 uh, response on the continent that we saw from our heads of states across uh, the 55 member states. So those numbers did not come. I mean, we are seeing them coming in the uh, later waves, but not in the beginning. The second thing is that the supply chain was completely disrupted. So completely that um, being able to protect our health workers was a huge, huge challenge in the beginning. And it, it has continued to be a challenge um, in, 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 in many ways, um, even up to now. Um, the, the real effective protection uh, for health workers um, has been affected because of the disrupted uh, su supply chain. The third thing that um, has happened is um, um, at all levels, uh, Africa has woken up to the fact that if we don't do things for ourselves, nobody will do it. And the current uh, crisis with the access to vaccines, I think gives uh, a very stark example of um, uh, uh, that huge gap that we have uh, as a continent. Now in the midst of all that is um, the, the clear, and now evidence is coming through that the health system has really, although it was not um, completely overwhelmed, it was stretched to the, um, the level that other health services suffered majorly. We were not seeing it then, but now as we continue to study our health systems, we see uh, that there were very, very significant um, uh, negative effects on uh, uh, continuous programs, whether it was malaria, HIV, TB, um, you know, childhood um, uh, uh, healthcare, all have been affected in very significant ways. Uh, and in this, and, and in this is a lesson for us that um, if we do not prepare well, it means any um, big outbreak or, God forbid, another pandemic um, may not treat us as as gently as this one uh, did. So we've learned very good lessons, and we are putting those lessons to use, and that's why we are putting in place initiatives and programs uh, that address those specific uh, lessons that we have learned. Right. And you know, looking ahead to next week's UN General Assembly and then the G20 meeting in October, what is the call to action you'd give global leaders when it comes to supply chain strengthening and making sure to you know, not keep their eye off the ball and uh, preparing for that next pandemic? Any call to action to them? Two calls to action. Uh, the first is um, appreciating that the globe has become small. And um, what is happening in one part of the world will definitely affect another part of the world. Um, the first call to action is um, uh, pledges should be delivered and delivered now. Um, making a pledge and then waiting for months to be able to deliver on it, uh, it's a wasted pledge, particularly in the context of the pandemic. So any pledge that has been made needs to be delivered today. The second um, call to action for uh, our heads of states um, uh, is that uh, globally, that is, is that um, uh, health security is the type of net where uh, if there's a hole in one part of the net, then the mosquitoes will get in. 
and anybody and everybody who is within the net is going to get affected. So we must approach health security with a global lens where um, if we are talking about manufacturing, we are talking about surveillance, we are talking about capacity building, it must be across the globe. And any part of the world that is left unattended to uh, is going to be the weak link and the rest of the world is going to suffer. These are the two calls of action uh, that I will have for our heads of state uh, for the UN General Assembly next week. Great. Well, um, again, thank you both for taking the time out of the very important work you are doing to be with us today. We will continue to dig into these issues in the rest of our event. Um, but to you both, uh, stay safe and be well. Thank you. Thank you. And you too, stay safe. Mm -hmm. All right, well, thank you. I would like to now bring on our panel to continue this discussion. So I'd like to welcome Luis Langoria Gandara, who is the Director of Technical Cooperation of Latin America and the Caribbean at IAEA. We have Barbara Lorenzo, who's the representative of Benin from UNFPA, Prashant Yadav, who's a senior fellow for the Center for Global Development, and Paul Malinaro, Chief of Operation Support and Logistics at WHO. Um, so welcome everyone. Just quick, if you, I see there already are a few questions that have come in, but if you do have any questions for our panelists, you can add them to the Q&A box. I'll keep an eye on, I'll try to see if we can get to a couple as time allows. Um, but again, thank you all for joining us today. So uh, Prashant, I'd actually love to start with you. Um, we just heard from Dr. Kabor and Dr. Uma how the COVID-19 pandemic has impacted supply chains and health systems on the African continent. Uh, you've worked with many governments and global organizations on improving healthcare supply chains. Can you break down why supply chains are so critical to strong health systems? And how can we use this pandemic as an opportunity to strengthen overall health systems and you know, build back better as we are often saying? Yeah, thanks, Kate. And, um... So supply chains are, I mean, I call them as the backbone of the health system. Um, I think we oftentimes think of them as, well, oh, that's what gets medicines and health products and preventive health technologies delivered to end beneficiaries and patients. We often forget that they play a second very important or equally important role, which is they bring back data of the type that other routine health management information systems cannot capture. They give us the ability to detect trends faster, sooner, and almost real time, which other mechanisms always not necessarily provide. So that's another part of why they are such an important part, why I call them a backbone. Um, what have we taken away from the last 18 months? One, well, three things that I would like to highlight. The first is we've got to look at the entire spectrum of risks that are relevant for the health product supply chain. And that means we have to look at raw material manufacturing, financing, money flow, who has more market power, international transport, in-country distribution, all of these elements in the supply chain, the risks that are embedded within them, we cannot uh, afford to ignore them. We cannot afford to not have a very clear risk management approach for the end-to-end -end supply chain. The second is that we cannot uh, create boundaries within organizations, within agencies on how supply chain work is organized or across agencies on how supply chains are organized based on definitions that we come up with. This is sourcing, this is procurement, this is international distribution, this is in-country distribution. Let's organize it, this value chain and give different agencies different tasks. That is not the way or some people organize their internal supply chain structures based on what the, their favorite management consulting firm designed as their org chart. Um, the only thing that agencies within and across agencies have to think about in supply chain design, and I, I repeat myself, one and only one thing is customer service. 
what guarantees the best customer service that should be the way we should organize the supply chain if that means completely changing which agency does what so be it if that means every agency being vertically integrated to carry out all the roles so be it uh, but customer service should be our single-handed focus not drawing out blueprints of architecture of let's say procurement will happen here let's say distribution will happen here that is a recipe for failure. If we haven't learned that lesson in the last 18 months, I will come out of this extremely disappointed feeling we didn't even look back and reflect on what has gone wrong. Third thing I want to mention is there has been intense public scrutiny and a lot of public attention on supply chains. And as a result of that, yes, lots of policy discussions, government leaders, heads of state getting interested in supply chain. But another important part is small innovators, citizen groups, people around the world, concerned citizens, they have become interested in helping to improve supply chains. They want to do something. And admittedly, their ideas are sometimes not very salient, according to us or many of the people who work in large agencies. They appear to be, oh, this little toy model, that can't really help us at the scale we are operating. That may be true. But we need to make supply chains more participative and more social. We cannot afford to say that Look, we are running this in Geneva or Copenhagen or Addis Ababa or Washington, D.C., and our supply chain approach and model uh, doesn't require your new app or it doesn't require your new citizen-led initiative or this new platform that you all concerned people have come together and created. We have to create an opportunity in the supply chain for such contributions to fit in. In the absence of that, we risk facing a public isolation of the supply chain community as these are the guys who don't take external inputs and are out in their agencies, wherever they are located, trying to do things and things are not working. By being participatory, we'll also expose people to how complex some of this is. So I think those are my key three points, but happy to look at questions or other uh, ideas. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Prashant. Um and Paul, I'd like to bring you in. So you're at WHO, um, the Chief of Operations Support and Logistics. Um, you know, so for supply chains, COVID-19 was really you know, an earthquake and you're probably <laughs> right at the epicenter. Um, so to continue the theme, um, you know, what aftershocks do you think this crisis will leave, um, particularly in lower and middle income countries in the years to come? And what are the things that maybe we're not even seeing now, but we should be preparing for as a result of this? Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Kate, and uh, th thanks for having for, for having me on. Um, so, the, the earthquake. <laughs> um, I think there's a, a couple of themes, and I, and I don't necessarily think it's limited to the health supply chain. I, I think it's going to be um, impacting supply chain thought um, in general. If we look back at COVID and we remove the big spike in demand, which is obviously a contributor to some of the shocks, um, and being able to quantify, being able to prioritize and triage demand is an important aspect that need to be considered. There were a couple of drivers. First, a breakdown in manufacturing. So if we take uh, Chinese New Year, which is an annual occurrence, is a 10 day to two week shutdown, and a lot of companies build around their planning around having that gap. When you have the first clusters of COVID in a large manufacturing city like Wuhan, where people went home for Chinese New Year and then were advised not to come back, even if it's for a temporary amount of time, the shock and repercussion of that can be quite profound. Um, you saw this in Malaysia with latex and with certain manufacturers when clusters of cases come. We're also surprised in northern Italy that there was such a large manufacturing base for swabs um, and for laboratory equipment. And of course, Lombardy, being a heavy industrial manufacturing zone, the shutdown there um, did have these big impacts. So that would be the first. Second, how rapidly the air network shut down with travel restrictions on people, airlines deciding there's no point for, for me to fly if I can't take passengers, and realizing how reliant we were on passenger scheduled cargo in the hold, 
for things like vaccine pharmaceuticals, high value, low volume goods. And the fourth, which I think we still feel today and which colleagues from, uh, from Africa CDC and from Burkina Faso mentioned, the export restrictions. This behavior in terms of civil defense, civil security to put export restrictions, including on raw materials and components has a profound impact. It had it in active pharmaceutical ingredients. It's still existing with vaccine today. Um, and in many cases, the amount of components that subcomponents are coming from different parts of the world. It's taking a long time for people to unpick the knot of why they're having disruptions because it's become complex. So the earthquake and where the rethinking is going to take place for me, and it is around sustainability, that just-in-time systems are a thing of the past. Commercial supply chain have cut so much excess and redundancy that if there is a crisis, there's no fat, there's no inventory to rely on, and it collapses very quickly. The other thing is a reliance or an addiction to cheap and predictable shipping and air transport. Again, there's a question mark around the sustainability and resilience of this. The third is the penchant for outsourcing and outsourcing and outsourcing. The more outside, the more outsourcing is driving to a, the lowest common denominator, which is cost. Except each level of outsourcing increases complexity and increases the risk uh, of, of, of impact, which for me gives just a general lack of resilience inherent in how it's designed in the global supply supply chain system. What Prashant was talking about with the, co the community kind of engagement supply chain on first look can seem a little bit of a dream, but at the same time, this community-based approach to supply and thinking local, I think is something that's going to be necessary. How it's operating now is proven that it doesn't work, that it is not resilient and is very susceptible to crisis. And if we think of increasing impact of climate change, that's just going to get worse. So we need a rethink. The pandemic was a big shot across the bow and a, and a warning shot for us all. Yeah, and Barbara, I'd like to bring you in. Prashant mentioned the importance of partnership um, the agencies that you represent working together. And some might think it's a you know a bit of an unusual mix of international agencies we have here today um, as part of this event. Um, but maybe you can talk a little bit more about how you are working together. You know, you're with UNFPA, how COVID-19 has maybe strengthened collaboration between the agencies and particularly to support you know frontline healthcare workers in reaching those um, in the last mile. Thank you very much, Kate, and thank you for bringing UNFPA in this important conversation. And you're right, we all know that the pandemic triggered new ways of working, and it also triggered a new generation of partnerships. And uh, we all went beyond our regular, you know, our comfort zone. And, and for good reason, because maybe for once we were all clear what we were fighting. I mean, we were all, we all had one goal, like supporting the health system and preventing the pandemics. Uh, just, so I am based in Benin in, in Western Africa. And just for you to, to, for the, to contextualize, um, we were in, in April when it was a, early April, one of the first cases arrived in, in Benin. And it was actually, unfortunately, a midwife in the main maternity hospital of the city. And, and there was all of those fears from across the globe, but the panic in Asia, Europe, US. So when it arrived in Benin, you can imagine the fear for the people. And actually even the health workers left and some of them ran away. And, and of course, short after, shortly after they were put in quarantine. And so the, the, the maternity clinic was closed for three full weeks. And the 500 women who were meant to deliver in this maternity actually went to deliver whoever, we don't know where. Uh, so, so the goal for all the partners was very clear. We had to put our, our forces together and, and pull, our sleeve, pull out our sleeves to, to find solutions. And uh, at, to make a long story short, we know now that are here, we know that we actually succeeded in supporting the government to maintain services. And, and we have some lessons learned. 
Um, one lesson is, of course, what Dr. Uma said just uh, some minutes before, is that we need the government to be in the driver's seat. And in Africa, we were so lucky because governments actually were the ones who were really so well prepared in comparison to the rest of the world to face a pandemic. And they were actually putting very strong measures, measures very early on in, in like mandatory masks is something that has been like since March, 2020 in Benin maybe, or like, you know, uh, testing at the airport, like April, 2020. So, okay. So we have the, 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 the local leadership that is obvious, but of course we also need resources. And, and that's where some partnerships like the, the Takeda Pharmaceuticals come to the, the conversation, because as Dr. Uma said, we want partners who can pledge, but also deliver quickly. And, and Takeda was there, pharmaceuticals were there to support and help us uh, support maternal health facilities in Benin, Togo, Guinea. And, and I think it's very important to have partners across the globe, and I mean it sincerely, who can think like you're in Japan, but you worry actually and you're concerned for a woman in Africa, where is she going to deliver in a pandemic time? I mean, it's very perceptive and, and farsighting. I, I, I think it is really a, a critical ingredient like local leadership and financial support. And then maybe two key uh, technical elements, and we all agree, I think here it's fantastic, that the local procurement has been capital in the response in Benin. Whatever the, the challenges were for UNFPA's UN agency, we said we will go and prioritize local procurement. Of course, it was complicated. The first masks were all fabric made, and 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 like the first, you know, every we were buying little supply by little supply. But it really first it was cheaper and quicker, and second also it helped the local resilience, economic resilience. So I think it's really interesting to hear that there's a common. We all, from different standpoint, we all agree on this. And, and the other really important lesson for us was really the integration of COVID services with maternal health services. And I, I'm really glad that we know that at the end, and uh, now like some months later, between Benin, Togo, Guinea, and the maternities that we supported, we had zero, zero maternal deaths. So we really succeeded in avoiding the second epidemic, the epidemics of maternal death. So, so that's a, a story of, of partnership that needs to be built on for the future. Thank you, Kate. Yeah, no, thank you. Okay. Showing the power of, of partnerships here. Um, so Luis, I'd love to bring you in and you're with the International Atomic Energy Agency. Um, some of our audience may be wondering how oh, IAEA oh, gets oh, involved oh, in oh, health service oh. delivery. Um, so maybe talk a little bit about what your role has been and then ways partnerships and cooperation has been key throughout um, the COVID crisis for, for you all. Thank you very much, uh, Kate. Uh, and yes, in this is uh, that question is very relevant. Why the IAEA? What is the role? Uh, well, um, the IAEA is uh, really not very well known or the work that we do on human health. Uh, maybe some people know us that we work in, in cancer therapy and so on, but it's a little known that we have work uh, in virus detection. And this is our, uh, uh, our key point here. Um, we are a specialized agency, a technical agency. Our uh, uh, forte is uh, the detection systems. Um, before the pandemic, we had already worked with countries uh, in Africa for Ebola or in Latin America for Zika. So we had already uh, a network of certain number of laboratories uh, around the world that we have been working for the detection of viruses. So we, we, we didn't start from zero. However, when the pandemic uh, struck, it took us all for surprise and uh, we had to uh, reinvent ourselves in, in many cases. Um, we uh, uh, were able in the end to uh, deliver uh, assistance to more than 300 uh, laboratories around the world with detection systems. Because if you remember, especially at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, the advice from WHO was test, test, test. There were no vaccines, nothing, uh, so we had to test. And uh, 
to be able to uh, assist uh, the countries around the world with these uh, uh, COVID detection systems uh, was, was a real challenge because, uh, well, we are talking about the supply chain. Everybody uh, 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 at the time had restrictions on, on the supply of certain equipment. I mean, if you wanted to uh, uh, procure certain equipment, it, it was really difficult. So we had to uh, really go around uh, many, many suppliers that uh, we weren't used to uh, do it like that. Uh, however, um, in the end, uh, we had some good lessons uh, learned and that uh, we were able to uh, support um, 130 countries around the world with uh, this uh, detection equipment. Um, as I said before, the, uh, the agency had already uh, experience with this type of help. Yes, at a much smaller scale, but uh, we were able to uh, uh, scale up this uh, assistance to, to all the, the, the countries. And uh, uh, the, the point here is that the, the assistance that we deliver was the same uh, in technology all around the world. We provide the equipment to big, medium, large countries all around the world with the uh, latest technology. Um, before COVID-19, many of us didn't know anything about uh, PCR. Uh, now is a common language because the PCR, as established by WHO, is the gold standard for diagnostic equipment. We already had experience with uh, uh, the, the PCR, with the laboratory. We have a, a, an extensive uh, laboratory uh, network that we've been working that is comprised with the human health laboratories, but also uh, veterinary labs that work on zoonotic diseases. So um, we started small and in the end, we were able to, to assist uh, um, all countries. Um, it was mentioned before that uh, the supply chain um, is the backbone of the of the health systems, and uh, I believe so uh, as well. And this was really tested because uh, we really had uh, a lot of uh, challenges in the in the supply chain, the trust funds, the customs, the supply, the integration of the systems, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, uh, it taught us uh, that we had to extend our 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 net work of partnerships. And here I would like to uh, really emphasize that new partners were key in this. The assistance that we got uh, from Takeda Pharmaceuticals was not only very generous, but also very timely and very expedite. Uh, we weren't used to uh, dealing with uh, this type of uh, uh, partners and uh, it was really, really uh, good and very important uh, contribution from Takeda. I want to dig in on this um, you know, local um, capacity issue and local, looking at local manufacturing. I think several people have mentioned today, local procurement, local manufacturing be um, a key to building more resilient health systems. Uh, Prashant, I know this isn't something that you speak to quite a bit. Um, so maybe you can talk a little bit about the role of local production um, and what progress do you see being made and obstacles still in the way? Yeah, thanks Kate. So first of all, I want to start by saying we ought to drop the word local and start calling it regional. The challenge is that local means every country for itself and that creates supply chain autarky self-reliance in supply chains. We are, we are not, uh, yes, resilience has been a challenge, but that doesn't necessarily equate to us saying every country becomes self-reliant in their health product or any other supply chain for that matter. So regional is important. Regional allow us, allows us to have greater geographical diversification in particular in regions where there is less um, manufacturing 
Africa being one of them, but also Latin America, Central Asia. Um, we need to think about how do you incentivize that? And when we think about regional manufacturing, it depends upon a common integrated market. So I think um, I, I've, one of the, the colleagues from Akame had mentioned about the African free trade uh, agreement, I think. So having a common market, whether it is coming from the free trade agreement or it is coming from common regulatory standards and the progress that is being made in Africa towards the African Medicines Agency, those are positive trends which will make it easier for a regional manufacturer, whether it's for medicines, diagnostics, um, vaccines. Uh, but in doing so, we also have to accept that there are many health products, including the ones that we needed during the pandemic, which are purchased using international procurement structures and using international financing. And uh, there comes the question of very large economies of scale that exist with manufacturing sites in Asia, in particular India and China. And if we too early start imposing price and cost parity on a regional manufacturer, expecting them to achieve the same cost of goods sold as is the cost of goods sold at a very large site in Western India or Eastern China, um, then essentially there is no future for regional manufacturing. We have to start thinking about what are we willing to pay as society in order to build resilience through regional manufacturing across all of the health product categories. And that's a matter of you know, policy debate. And, and we can solve those some of those things through analytics, data, clever thinking, but behind that needs to be um, a, a convening group, a group of political leaders who accept this, internalize this, not just rhetorically, but actually in financing uh, a slightly higher price, if that's what it comes down to. So I think the technical questions we can solve, we have a lot of you know, very capable people who can run the analytics and so on. It is about internalizing some of this part. Thank you. Yeah, I'd like to stay on that topic of financing. And we do actually have a question that came around um, around this, what needs to be done at a very high level to bring together key funders who are decision makers to push some of the recommendations ahead. You know, looking at the financing landscape, um, we've seen even a reduction in um, investments. So Paul, I will punt this to you. Um, what do you think needs to be done? And you know, given this landscape, how can the supply chain strengthening be, be financed in these countries? Yeah, I think it's a uh, it's a tough question, um, and I I mean I totally agree with Prashant in terms of the sub regional regional development of the manufacturing base. Agree on the uh, free trade areas, reducing that regulatory friction on the movement of goods um, between countries. Um, it, it's something that needs to be that needs to be done. But again, I, I, I find it hard to separate out the medical and health supply chain system from overall the sustainable development go goals. This system still needs infrastructure. It needs roads. It needs electricity. It needs uh, 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 internet connection, needs educated, a well-educated workforce to be able to run some of this sophisticated uh, 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 concept. So it's beyond medical maturity in the transport sector and logistics sector needs to come probably outside of medical, but certainly that needs to be a, a key part of it. Um, but I, I asked myself why, and I, I lived for some time in, in Jordan, it's 10 million people, it doesn't have oil, it's in the middle of a rough neighborhood, um, thriving pharmaceutical production industry. Uh, both on generics and on, on, under license in export processing zone, it seems to work. Um, so I'm sure there are lessons from some of these places that, that can and should be taken on board. In terms of the larger sort of financing, and just again, I'm, 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 I'm reluctant just to focus on, on the international aid uh, system. Um, and really, uh, in terms of, of investment, as the colleagues from Africa had said, if you look at vaccine, the 
African countries were willing and had the money to try and, and, and access 50% of their need. Right now they have, including with COVAX, 3.54% done. So this wasn't a question of money. This was a question of access. And I think there are practical things that can be done, certainly in the experience with, with financing and annual budgeting within the national budgeting, as well as taking a look at the finance and procurement regulations. I've been in with, in, in with you know, fairly big countries with a lot of money. Their procurement system doesn't allow for multi-year procurement contracts. How are you going to compete? How are you going to engage with vaccine manufacturing when you can only issue a purchase order valid for a year or valid for a very limited quantity? This is something that's easy to change. In the same way, some, some of them and, and the procurement agents of uh, the ministries of health, whether it's a separate entity or a part of, sometimes the disbursement and the actual funds come late. Again, in a single year budgeting process, the vaccine is needed now. And so they have to make deals where they can delay payment for six months. Of course, the price of the vaccine is going to be high. Even without the credit line, the price of the vaccine is going to be high if you cannot have three year deals. So I think around pooled procurement, being able to, again, get the volume, as Prashant mentioned, there has to be a, a leeway also in the national regulation to be able to accept paying a higher price initially for manufacturers that are closer to you, the quality assurance aspects of that. So it's a mix. I think, and I think it, it, those changes have to be driven nationally and amongst regional uh, entities the support that's needed to understand, I think, the market, some of these international markets, and the sophisticated sophistication of some of them, and how to engage with them in a way where you are not the weaker party. And if that means combining together and working with international financing institutions to ensure that the volume and liquidity is behind you in negotiations, I think is a is a first doable and profound step uh, forward. Yeah, thank you, Paul. And I know we are getting close to the end of our time together today, but um, Barbara, I'd love for you to maybe follow on that. And if we're looking ahead at the UN General Assembly next week, see these types of discussions are top of mind. Um, what would you like to see happen or um, conversations be had? And, or what advice would you have to leaders that are meeting um, over the next week or two on, on how we can make progress on some of these challenges? Thank you, Kate. Um, I think one of the very important lessons of, of the pandemics is, as Prashant said, we, we were able somehow to include the citizens in the responses, especially young people. And, and, and the solution went through innovation. In many times, I know it's kind of a buzzword, but in many countries, and, and including in Benin, a lot of activity went on with young people developing their own solutions for so many elements of the pandemic response and is actually something that was developed earlier but then the pandemic accelerated uh, this process of innovation and 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 uh, in the case of Benin we were having a number of discussions with, with and, and and solutions being developed with in young innovators before the pandemic on uh, maybe less for like uh, local production, local manufacturing of, of several items. And then with the pandemic, it, it turned out to be like a 3D uh, face shields for protection. So Prashant will say it's much more expensive than being printed, of course, in, in India. But so the, the young people have solutions, that's one. And, and the solutions with the pandemic were able to be deployed and like in a very, very, manner in Benin there's a national agency of innovation and for example drone deli drone based delivery up to the last mile to develop to to deliver blood products from women when delivering when there's a hemorrhagia was we were able to accelerate the the, the testing and the development of the business model for drone de drone based delivery up to the last mile and that is something because the pandemic accelerated all processes and, and I think uh, one lesson for the General Assembly or maybe one message is 
as Prashant said and, and Paul and everyone said, yes, we are aware of uh, the, the economics dilemmas and we need to make sure that we, we manage efficiently the, the resources, but putting young people in the center is critical. And those tech solutions like drones, the, the drone-based delivery definitely is bringing solution that we were not in seeing before. So we need to push and be able to be bold and, and risk take some risk, but you know, reasonable risk and, and measure and adapt to business model. That's what is being done in Benin now in, and, and, and in some other countries of the continent. And I think this is really the, the message for the General Assembly I would have like, uh, let's invest in those innovations because they bring solution for young people, but also bring solutions for the supply chain and, and will make the cost efficiency analysis at the end. <laughs> if I can say. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, and Luis, just maybe your quick final um, message to everyone and message lead up to the General Assembly next week. <clears throat> well, the, the message will be that uh, how to be prepared for uh, the future pandemics. Uh, we have to be uh, prepared and uh, uh, we can do a lot of things for that preparation and how to respond to uh, emergencies like this. Um, the key message will be how uh, all actors, governments, local uh, uh, institutions, uh, uh, private sector can be involved in this. Uh, this uh, pandemic uh, uh, shows us that uh, uh, it's possible to do it. I mean, the, 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 the partnerships uh, flourish during the pandemic because we were able to, uh, and we had to do things different ways. And uh, that those are the lessons that we will take uh, to the next uh, uh, pandemic. And uh, in the General Assembly is that the, the problem uh, is addressed by everybody. Um, somebody said uh, the world is uh, smaller after COVID, and indeed it is, and uh, it belongs to everybody to, to solve. Um, the, the, the key to be able to deliver uh, the goods uh, on time, the, the, the training, the necessary uh, uh, materials to, to do your, your, your work, uh, is is extremely uh, important, and uh, uh, we have to learn from these uh, uh, lessons. And we have a lot of positive uh, uh, lessons to to learn, like uh, in our case, engaging with the private sector uh, companies like Takeda Pharmaceutical was a real key for us to deliver the assistant on time and efficiently. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Well, um, this has been a fascinating conversation. I think we probably could all spend uh, hours discussing this, um, lots of big issues, but um, I'd like to thank you all, uh, Louise, Prashant, Barbara, and Paul for joining us today. Um, before we depart, I would like to bring in Gerard Rebello, who's head of WFP Health Supply Chain Strengthening Team. Um, Gerard has been listening on the sidelines. Um, and so thank you for, for joining us here. Um, just want to see what, what have been your main takeaways from the conversation today. Uh, thanks, Kate. And it's a pleasure to be here representing WFP um, on behalf of our director, Alex Marinelli, who unfortunately is traveling to Afghanistan given the recent events there. And he does send his apologies. Um, but it's been a very interesting one hour listening to the speakers here and uh, quite a few takeaways. But I think we, we zoom into a couple of points uh, o over the last hour. Uh, and, and, and one central theme that came out has been about the whole, you know, shorten lead times, regionalization, as Prashant would call it, uh, we tend to think we tend to use the semantics of localization, but I think uh, his point on regionalization really, really resonates here, you know, um, and, and Dr. Kaboria as well, you know, alluded to that, made, made a strong point on that with regards to being, to, 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 to localization, regionalization. Um, 
Prashant also goes very strongly, and I think this opens a, 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 a lot for supply chain professionals, is the complete rethink. And the fact that he talks about customer service and listening to, to the common people, which we sometimes, as he alluded to, sometimes forget, and we don't take that opportunity to look at some of the more, what could be perceived as simplistic solutions. Uh, the other point highlighted today, and I think which came out was about partnerships, particularly with the private sector. And maybe this is an opportunity for me to give a shout out to Takeda Pharmaceuticals, you know, for sponsoring this event, but also bringing to, and bringing together key uh, speakers uh, to, to engage in this in this interesting discussion. Um, and and then I think finally um, the 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 part that that. Is, is a big question mark that the speakers here, particularly Paul and Prashant again, have, have big experience in, is in the whole financing mechanism, that that is something which goes beyond the technical sides of supply chain, but it's an area that really needs a lot of advocacy uh, and policy, et cetera, to make some of these technical decisions more workable given the landscape uh, and the areas where we work in. So yeah, a lot of discussions, a lot of good points and, and a lot for us to take back and think. And as Dr. Uoma, you know, very eloquently said, we're all part of that same mosquito net. And I think that's a very strong message that we need to take back today. So yeah, thanks Kate for this opportunity. Yeah, thank you all. Um, and yeah, thank you again to our panelists and to your audience for joining us today. Um, I'd also like to again, thank our partners, the UN World Food Program, the International Atomic Energy Agency, the United Nations Population Fund and Takeda Pharmaceutical Company for helping to make this conversation happen. Um, yeah, this is a big topic, a big issue. It's one that we are covering and will continue to cover at DevEx. I um, invite you to join us next week as we continue to explore these issues and many more. Um, and a part of our coverage of the UN General Assembly, we have a variety of events lined up for you. Also, if you aren't already, make sure you are subscribed to our weekly newsletter, DevX Checkup for frontline behind the scenes reportings on global health. Um, it's your best resource for staying top of global health issues, including these issues of uh, supply chain and health systems. Um, but in the meantime, uh, stay safe and be well, and thank you everyone for joining us today.